so glad that everyone is here. I am. We had a hundred people sign up for this webinar, which listen, I love reviews of literature and I love this kind of stuff, but I really did not think that that many other people were as excited about it as I was. Um, so this is a scholarly snippets webinar titled Reviews of Literature Getting Started. And my name is Molly Montgomery. I am the uh, director of the library at the Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine. And so, oops, let me see here. Okay, so as you heard, this webinar is being recorded. And by continuing to be in this webinar, you are consenting to being recorded. The recordings are available at our YouTube channel. This is the bit.ly link. If you are not comfortable being recorded live, if you registered for this, you will get a link later on for the recording. So this webinar is part of a series um, entitled the Scholarly Snippet Series. These are webinars which are designed to help you advance your research skills and support your scholarly activities. These are organized and taught by librarians at osteopathic medical schools all over the United States. And the audience is pretty wide ranging. They range from students at these schools and faculty, as well as clinicians, librarians, and pretty much anyone who's interested in scholarly activity and learning more about research. So today's objectives, we are going to talk about reviews of literature, including the value, the different types of reviews of the literature, we're going to identify the type of review that's right for you, or if you're a librarian, the review that might be right for your users. And just a reminder, this is only 25 or 30 minutes. There, there is definitely not time to go in depth or to tell you everything I would love to tell you about reviews in literature. So just, re just remember, it is a high level overview. So why are reviews of literature important? Um, from a biomedical standpoint, at least, there are almost a million articles that are added to PubMed every single year. No one can keep up with this, no matter how specialized your field is or how niche it is, there's just too much information to keep up with. Um, one of the reasons we like lit reviews is they can provide really important overviews that other people take the time to read a bunch of articles, provide a synthesis and an overview so the rest of us don't have to spend all that extra time. And literature reviews can also identify gaps in the research where there are opportunities for additional research or where things that need to be addressed. And for those new to research, it's also a good way to start writing and publishing and becoming part of that scholarly uh, record. So I've been saying reviews the literature and literature reviews, and this is titled literature reviews. But I figured if I said introduction to knowledge syntheses, no one would show up because no one knows what that means. But really, that is what all of this is. This is types of knowledge synthesis. And there are a big range of different types of knowledge syntheses, ranging from things that you've heard of, such as meta analyses and scoping reviews and systematic reviews, all the way down to narrative reviews. There was one article that I read that said there's something like 50 different types of um, knowledge syntheses, which when I read that, I was like, no, that doesn't seem right. That seems like way too much. But it's true, there are a ton out there, though the ones we're going to focus on are pretty much the ones that are on this page. So one of the questions that was sent to us prior to the webinar um, from one of the registrants was a question about what are some of the trends in the publication of things like systematic reviews? So I did a quick search on it, and I saw that um, there was a study that was done that found that there's over 80 systematic reviews published every day. So if you have been looking at this type of research and you're saying, there just seems to be a lot more than there used to be, you're completely right. There are so many more because a lot of people are getting really interested in, in writing these types of reviews. Um, a, pub, a study of PubMed found that there's a 2,700 increase in systematic reviews and meta-analyses over the last 20 years. And that was compared to about a 300% increase in randomized controlled trials. So it's not just that people are writing more in general, they're writing more and doing more systematic reviews. And someone asked a question specific to COVID. And so I looked this up. And there was one study that said that for every one randomized control trial that was specific to COVID, there were nine systematic reviews published. And I, I know I saw this somewhere, but I couldn't find it. 
but there was some study that said that a lot more people were doing systematic reviews and meta-analysis, especially during the lockdown period, because they couldn't do original research. They couldn't get into their labs. I couldn't find the reference for that, but I know I read it somewhere. So if someone else can find the reference, I would love it because it was making me crazy. I couldn't find it. Okay, so um, before we start talking about the different types of literature reviews, I wanna talk about why there is some sort of confusion about what literature reviews mean. And I'm gonna look at things that are considered literature reviews, but that are not the same. So this is what you see a lot when you're looking at research articles like randomized control trials. They tend to have a really brief literature review as part of the larger article. This can be something like two to four articles where they're just giving a broad overview of the literature that exists. If it's not in depth, it's not super systematic. They're just saying, here's what's out here and this is how our study fits into it. There are also articles that are called narrative reviews. These are articles that really are, all they are is articles about the research on a particular topic. They can be pretty specific in scope. They can very, be very broad in scope. I love a good review article because I think it saves a lot of time. They're not super, tend not to be super technical and it's a good way to get um, a general sense of a topic. But these are not systematic reviews. They're looking at some of the literature, not all of the literature and they aren't super transparent in how they're choosing their articles or how they're doing their searches. Then you have systematic reviews. These are a research methodology in, unto themselves. They tend to be very transparent in their methodology. They have very in-depth searches. They are reproducible and they show you, they're supposed to at least tell you how they search and where they search, and they are, they are a rigorous methodology. So why does this matter? Why, why do I care about the distinction of these different terms? And why do a lot of librarians care about the distinction between these different terms? Well, reviews are on a continuum where we have very rigorous high level of methodology like your meta-analyses and your systematic reviews. And then you have those that are less rigorous but can still provide value like a narrative review. And these terminology and definitions matter and not just to librarians, because if you are doing what you may consider a systematic review and you send it into a journal editor and it's not really a systematic review, it's more of a narrative review, they're going to reject your paper because they know what they should know what a real systematic review looks like. Um, so some of the key features of a high level review are they are transparent and they're reproducible and they're rigorous. That's not to say that narrative reviews are not okay. They're totally fine. I love a great narrative review. And especially for students, I think it's a good place for them to start. So <laughs> if you take nothing else away from this presentation, I want you to know that not everything is or should be a systematic review. Um, I think a lot of my time spent as a medical librarian has been telling people, no, <laughs> you cannot do a systematic review. And it's usually to a response to someone saying something like this, that they really want to do one, they don't have very much time, and they'll search Google. <laughs> and <laughs> my response is usually, nope. Uh, this is the Nope Stradamus card from the uh, game Exploding Kittens, which is one of my favorite cards because I think it's hysterical. Um, I spend a lot of time saying no to um, faculty and students who say they want to do a systematic review but don't really know what they're asking and that's okay because i think it's a great opportunity to tell them what is a systematic review actually and this is a really great table that i like from um, the libguides at psu where they have a, i think a really good um, analysis of what's a systematic review and what's that more standard narrative or literature review all of this is good, and I think it pro can provide good information about what kind you would actually want to do. But what I focus on really is this number of authors and the timeline. With a systematic review, you cannot get away with one author. You can really not even get away with two. You want three or more. Uh, with a literature review, you can do that solo. That's fine. And the timeline, that is something that is really hard to understand is that a systematic review takes a really long time. Average is 18 months, whereas a literature review, this is okay for weeks or months. So I generally show people this sign or this table if they're really determined to do a systematic review, but maybe don't exactly understand what that entails. So some of the general steps in doing high-level reviews are you assemble a team, 
You formulate the question, which tends to be very specific. You develop and register a protocol. You find and screen and select studies. This is what takes a ton of time because usually you are looking through thousands and thousands of articles. You then appraise the studies, extract the data, you synthesize all those findings and you publish. And I told myself last night when I was making this presentation, you are a professional. There's a hundred people signed up for this. You probably shouldn't put Teletubbies in, but sorry, <laughs> it's just too funny. So squad goals, a really good high level review takes a very good team. And so you really want to have a good team. Um, so we talk about protocols when we are discussing systematic reviews and high level reviews. And a protocol includes um, information about the design and reporting of the systematic reviews. This is something that you do before you even start your study. What is really good, especially for Prisma, is it has a, a basic checklist, like a two page checklist that says, these are all the things your systematic review needs to include, and this is where they should appear in the paper. It allows the researchers to plan, especially researchers that are new to systematic reviews and don't really know their way around it. It also makes the process really transparent because if everyone is following these Prisma protocols, then you know where to look for certain items when you are reading a systematic review. So you will see generally in the method section of a systematic review that they said that they followed the Prisma recommendations. You will also see information about registering your protocol. This isn't required for everyone, but it tends to be a standard and a good practice when doing a high level review, like a systematic review or a scoping review. And again, this is done before the review is started. You write your protocol, which is telling the world basically what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. You do this because it can help avoid duplication. These studies take a really long time. So you wanna go ahead and put your, basically your flag in the ground that says, I am going to, we or my team is going to study this particular topic. So people know that's what you're going to do. And it's also a very good idea to look in one of these registries before, before doing your own review, because you don't wanna duplicate. You don't wanna waste your time. Um, this tends to not be necessary for narrative reviews, again, because they're not nearly as rigorous. And when it comes to registering a protocol, there's a lot of places to do it. Prospero is one of the big ones, the Open Science Framework, OSF, JBI, Cochrane. There's a lot of options depending on the type of review you're doing, the level of maybe the rigorous methodology you're engaging in, your topic, all that sort of stuff depends on where you'd want to register it. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the main review types. We've already sort of mentioned systematic reviews, but I do want to go into a little more detail because it's what everyone wants to do. It's the cool thing. So a systematic review requires a really well-crafted research question. These tend to be very specific and for better or for worse, they tend to be intervention based. Not always, but that's a lot of what the research is. So is one thing better than another? They also have pretty well-defined inclusion and exclusion criteria, which talks about, are you looking for only English language papers? Are you only looking at randomized control trials? Are you including other types of studies? Um, they want a very detailed and reproducible search strategy. And this is, tends to be where librarians get involved. So if you are working on a systematic review and you don't have a librarian on your team, I will tell you right now, all librarians are going to be very judgy about your systematic review because we are the search experts. This is what we do best. Always make sure you have a librarian on that, that's, that dream team. Um, a very detailed protocol. You really want to be able to tell people how you're searching, where you're searching, why you're doing this sort of study. And one of the big differences from systematic reviews to narrative reviews is you search everywhere, both the published and non-published data. So um, you're searching not just things like PubMed, but you're also searching uh, for unpublished clinical trial data. You're looking in conference proceedings. So this tends to be called gray literature, and that's something you need to include as well, because you're looking for the whole body of literature. You're generally reviewing thousands and thousands of abstracts and articles, so much reading. There tends to need two or more authors to review each abstract or article. That's why you really can't do a systematic review as a solo project. And each article and source needs to be critically appraised for the quality. They tend to be looking for all these levels of bias when you're looking at systematic reviews. 
<laughs> Generally, when I go into this detail with students or faculty, they're like, nah, nope, 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 nope. I'm out of here. Like, I do not want to do this, which is fine. I'm not trying to scare people. I'm just trying to give you a really clear awareness of what is involved with a systematic review. So a meta-analysis is actually higher level than systematic review, but it's best to understand systematic reviews first because you cannot have a meta-analysis without having a systematic review. You need all of those steps that we just went through to have a meta-analysis. And please don't tell any biostatisticians that I, I wrote this sentence, but they're basically systematic reviews with math and statistics where you're pooling all of the studies to try to compare them as if they are one study. And when you're looking at meta-analyses, you tend to see the word heterogeneity thrown around a lot. That means, are the studies too different to compare? So all these studies may be done very differently or they're analyzed very differently and you can't always combine those. So sometimes you may want to do, or a team may want to do a meta-analysis, but they can't because they're just too different. So you know you're looking at a meta-analysis when you see something like this. This is called a forest plot and it's a visual representation of all the different studies. It's beyond the scope to explain how to read it, but it actually is really easy to read. And I really love a meta-analysis because you can jump straight into a forest plot and know exactly what the conclusions are without reading the whole study. Just look on YouTube, it takes five minutes to learn how to interpret these. So basically a systematic review or a meta-analysis are great for teams with time. They take an average of five authors and average of 67 weeks to complete. This is not a quick or a solo process by any means. So scoping reviews. Scoping reviews are a type of systematic review, but they tend to not have a super focused question. They tend to be based on a broader topic. They don't always do an assessment of the quality of the articles, and they don't have scary statistics like you see in meta-analyses but they still are rigorous because they include that explicit search criteria. They should have protocols and it takes just as much time because you have a lot of articles to screen and a lot of reading. There tends to be some level of synthesis, but not nearly as much as with a meta-analysis or systematic review. I see a lot of scoping reviews in nursing and in medical education because those tend to be broader topics. This is what a scoping review looks like, well, like the table anyway, where it tends to be very narrative based. There's not a lot of numbers. You're not looking at odds ratios or relative risk or anything. It's just, it's just words or descriptive statistics like this, where you see counts and percentages, much easier and less maybe terrifying to read than a meta-analysis. You also have mapping reviews, and these are really interesting because they're looking much more about the where, the who, the when of research, versus the research results. So it's much less about the findings and more about the studies themselves. I like them because they have really pretty, pretty pictures, AKA a visual synthesis of the data. And these are done to help identify gaps in the literature because you can visually see them as in this particular study, which is an evidence map or a mapping review linking dietary sugars to health outcomes. And you can see in the chart on the left, they are looking at um, how many studies on different topics were published over a certain number of years. But then the bubble map, which is on the right, you can see the more bubbles, the more well covered that particular topic is, the fewer, the less that topic is covered. So you can really clearly identify gaps in the literature. So back to the, there's 80 systematic reviews published every day. We are now getting to a point that there's so many systematic reviews that we are doing systematic reviews of systematic reviews, which hurts my head, but that's where we're at. Um, these tend to require a systematic review expert because they are reanalyzing all of this data and they need to know how to work with that. So this is an example of a meta-analysis of other meta-analyses, which again, hurts my head, but it can be really helpful because now we get so many of these, we need to look at an umbrella review in order to get a better sense of what's out there in the literature. Uh, then you have rapid reviews. This is systematic in nature, but it tends to omit or simplify some of the steps of a systematic review. The search isn't nearly as comprehensive, you're supposed to still be transparent in where and how you search though. 
There is limited critical appraisal of the articles, so we are looking at an increased risk of bias. Definitely saw a lot of rapid reviews for COVID-19 stuff because people just want, they didn't have 18 months basically to get this data out there. We were doing it much more quickly. Then there are living reviews. I think these are interesting as well because it's a review which is continually updated. It doesn't finish until it gets to a point where maybe new information isn't coming out quite as quickly. Um, there's new searches every month or even more frequently. And a living re review can be a scoping review. It can be systematic. There's even guidelines that are living reviews. So they are great for topics that change or update rapidly, but the bad part is they are very time consuming, especially for the people keeping up. And will it ever end? <laughs> Who knows? So again, COVID and coronavirus, that tends to be where we were focusing a lot of our living reviews on, at least in the last year and a half or so. And finally, we're going to talk about narrative reviews, and these are not as intense from a methodological stance. There's no real protocol requirements. They take a ton less time, but they also have a lack of transparency. You don't know where the person searched, how they searched, um, what were their inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, of course, that means they're prone to bias. But what I tell students and people who I tell them, no, you can't do a systematic review, is that you can have a narrative review that is systematic. That is, you can be explicit with where you're searching. You can be explicit with how you're searching. You can include inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I'm seeing more and more narrative reviews that are like this. They still are not systematic reviews because they're not looking at all the literature. They don't have a big team of people, but they're a narrative review that is more systematic. So this is the big question, which review should you choose? It's hard, I mean, it depends. The really, the, all I could have put is that it depends, but it really does depend on all of these questions. How much time do you have? How many people are you working with? Do, are you looking at something that's focused or much more broad in nature? What's your goal? Who's the audience? And what's your level of expertise? That's a question only you or your patron or user can answer. And that's going to have different answers depending on, on these questions. Um, and this is a great chart. So thank you, University of Toronto Libraries for creating a beautiful chart so I didn't have to, where they have the different types of knowledge synthesis on the left-hand side and at the top, they have some of the different criteria for each of these about protocols and where should you register your protocols, is it a comprehensive search, do you have to do critical appraisal and statistical evidence or analysis, all of this sort of stuff, as well as the average amount of time. Really great share this with anyone who has questions about what type of review to choose. Okay, so summing up, there's so many types of knowledge syntheses and not everything has to be a systematic review. Please don't choose everything as a systematic review. Um, and you wanna choose wisely the type of review, review you want based on the time, the team and level of expertise. And when in doubt, ask an expert. It might be a librarian, it might be a methodological expert, there's lots of people that know a lot more about this than me, especially, but um, feel free to, to reach out. Uh, if you want to learn more, here's some of the sources that I use on a regular basis, but including, I learn a lot on you just searching YouTube and wonderful library libguides. There's librarians out there who've already created some really great information and resources that have helped me definitely learn more about this. Okay, so feedback. Um, there will be an evaluation sent to your email for those of you who've registered. Do share your thoughts about the session. I'm always looking for constructive criticism about how to make this better. Um, our next scholarly snippets webinar is going to be on November 16th, and it's about boosting your scholarly profile. And there's a registration link here as well. And how am I doing? I have five whole minutes. Excellent. So are there any questions or comments? I can see there's maybe some things in the chat. There um, are we several got? questions in the chat. Okay. So I'll go ahead and I'll start from the beginning, from the earliest questions. I think one you already addressed, which was speak on scope, where scoping reviews fit, as I understand they are as robust as a systematic review. Correct. And they tend to be, it's the question, I think is the biggest difference. If you have a really specific PICO style question, that's much more systematic review. If you have a broader style question, it tends to be more scoping but they are just as rigorous and take just as much time. 
Peggy Edwards had something to share, which was go to best evidence in medical education for doing reviews on medical education. They have protocol registration, very important information. Excellent, thank you. Michelle asked, do you need as many authors and as much time for a scoping review as you would for a systematic review? Yes, because you have to go through the same level of um, analyzing the abstracts and screening. And that's usually where you need multiple authors. So you might need not need as much, but really I'm working on a scoping review right now and it's been helpful to have a lot of people. So <laughs> <laughs> the more the merrier, I say. Okay. Next question, which uh, somebody else responded to in the chat was, do you know of software that helps create bubble maps? I don't. So if someone else did, that's great. Yes. Uh, someone mentioned you can create bubble plots in GraphPad Prism, which Western University provides for, for students. Nice. Someone asked if you could briefly explain integrative reviews. Oh, I don't know a lot about integrative reviews, actually. I know they are one of the things that I've seen a lot of, but I didn't include this in here and I didn't, it didn't look into this. So if anyone else has an answer to that, feel free to jump in. Okay, just going down through the list here. Okay, he didn't, sorry. <laughs> um, I had a doctoral student putting together a research proposal whose advisor wanted her to include a Prisma flowchart along with her literature review. I was totally stumped because that methodology doesn't make sense for a basic literature review. Can't screen every record in a search result list, not enough time. So reporting number of results, deduplication, screening didn't seem appropriate. Do you ever see this? I do. Um, I'm seeing this more and more in that, that trend to make narrative reviews more systematic. I have seen Prisma flowcharts. They might not call them that, but they show their process, which I'm not totally opposed to because I do like that transparency. I like to see how many did you start with? How many did you screen? What were you left with? Um, I think it's interesting and additional data is fine. It isn't as long as they're not going using that and then saying, okay, we use this flowchart. So now it's a systematic review. Like, that's not true, but I'm, I'm not opposed to it. I think it's great information to have as a reader. I just, maybe I'm just nosy, but I also like just to see what was your process? What did you go through? Okay. <laughs> Would I have done it that way? The next question is, I'm just starting to learn more about the various handbooks and resources available through JBI, Cochrane, et cetera. Any suggestions on which resource researchers and students should start with or how I can better explain the differences between the resources. I'm a librarian primarily working with medical students and faculty. That's a really good question. Um, just overview, and this is, this is broad, like a broad brush stroke. JBI tends to look at more scoping reviews, nursing, allied health, medical education. Cochrane tends to be much more related to medicine focus questions and interventions. So that's how, I mean, again, there's definitely overlap there, but that tends to be how I guide people. Um, a lot of JBI stuff is behind paywalls. So generally some of that JBI stuff is, you have to be a subscriber to get to it. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And most of Cochrane stuff, at least the guides and the manuals, I think are freely available. So that's basically my level of knowledge on those and about how to advise choosing, but good question. Thank you, Molly. I think at least one person had a, a question that they wanted to verbalize and I will open the floor to anybody else that has questions that they'd like to ask. Maybe there are not any additional questions. Nice, right on time. Um, I'm gonna go ahead. There's my email address and my Twitter handle. So please, if there were questions that were not answered in this presentation, I'm sure there weren't because again, it was a fast overview and high level, please reach out to me. I love talking about this stuff. Again, I'm by no means a methodology expert in these fields, but I've seen enough of it to be dangerous, I guess. So, but I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to talk about it. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share. Um, but thank you everyone for attending. This was so great. Um, it was so lovely to see everyone. So um, 
again, reach out and please attend future scholarly snippets webinars because they're a lot like this, a lot of fun, good overview, good place to get started. So thank you everyone. Thank you, have a great day. <laughs>